they have like this postpartum depression, they start taking her herb and she shifts them out of that state of being into re-embracing coming into the next phase of their life. You know? And it's because she's so bitter and so intense. I think she doesn't allow you to like get comfortable into your <laughs> negativity. So I really appreciate it about her and I like to add her into teas. You know, I'm not anti buying teas, I just think we've overdone it. You know, you go into some health food store, I imagine there's one in Chattanooga, right? And you go into a health food store there and there's like a whole aisle of and they're like boxes with plastic around them and then there's individual little plastics and then there's individual little filters with little staples and a little string and a little thing there and you're like, wow. You know the tea costs like a tenth or a hundredth of, of the box and the kind of and all that. And then and then you look down the aisle and you know how much is really there? There's like thirty different kinds of way of packaging peppermint. And it's like, all right, you know, this is ridiculous. So and really most of our teas are right here in the garden. So like 90% of the time, why not use the teas around you? And then every once in a while, you know, have a rooibos or a black tea or a whatever teas you're excited about from around the world. I, I think, you know, tea, we've been trading spices and teas for thousands of years. I think that's going to go on, I hope, and, and I think it's beautiful. But uh, for your regular daily tea and your medicine tea and your nutritional tea, right here in the garden, we need to have another Boston tea party, basically, is what I'm saying. We need to have a Lipton tea party. And just like yeah. toss all that crap out and reinstate the medicine cabinet and the kitchen cabinet and our lives with teas. Teas are a, a key medicine and I don't mean that lightly at all. I really think it's essential. So a mother work reminds me of that because she is such a warrior, another mint. Yeah. You want to nibble or you can. You want to get a sense of the bitter. Leonoris. Leonoris. Like a lion. Mm -hmm. For those of you still working with that idea, this is why we wanted to do that talk to me. So you, we could jump right to this and say, see, that's that's in the same genus. So there's a whole bunch, and then there's the one you see in the woods with the big leaves, right? The shiny big leaves. That's Ilex opaca. So we, this is Ilex vomitoria, and I remember when I first heard uh, heard this one, he was some kind of an astute professor. I don't remember his name, and he was just like Ilex vomitoria. He he he. Aren't those savages stupid? Kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And because he was commenting on the history of it being called the black drink, that the uh, native Cherokee and other people would drink and then throw up. And he didn't, you know, he never thought about it deeper than that. But, you know, these guys aren't just running around throwing up. There's a reason they're doing this, right? So what they would do is they'd go into this fasting and then they'd drink this, uh, this, this leaves cooked down for a while into a black drink that you couldn't see through. They'd drink it, they'd throw up. It would clean the, the, the lining of their stomach. They'd drink more, they'd keep drinking more, and it would just send this caffeine-like rush to their brain, you know? And when they say, well, we only use about 10% of our brain, so all of a sudden we're getting this rush of energy to our brain. Apparently, these guys would open up into, they'd have a sense of prescience, and they could talk about uh, the cattle run, or not the cattle, but the, uh, you know, the, the elk run over the hills, and they could talk about the, the turkeys coming in, and the different, uh, deer, the movement of the deer, they could talk about the other tribes around them, they could talk about the weather of what was coming. With this enough accuracy that this went on for thousands of years, with enough accuracy that other tribes wanted these leaves and they would carry them over a five-state region, region to trade them, why don't we give them a sense of efficacy? Why don't we give them a sense of saying, hey, let's try it out, let's bring it in, let's see what it does. No, we don't do that. We order Ilex paraguensis from South America or even more so we drink black teas from slavery down in India and other parts of the world. But here's this plant, and this is a plant that our society, this is the kind of plant that we need so much because we need some visioning, we need some help of guidance because we're, we're lost, we're off the, off the trail as a, as a culture. You know, we need to get some insights about how to be because we're certainly not doing it right. I think everyone's probably well aware of that, you know, what's going on right now in the world. So this Yopan, this uh, Ilex vomitoria, this black drink is, I think, one of the key plants to help us reawaken and flower, you know, as a species. And it, and it, it used to be known that way, and now, now it's forgotten. So hopefully we can, and I don't want you to limit to that. I want you to go in the woods and get the big leaf ones and toast those too. You heard uh, Patrick say that this is the only one that at least he was aware of that had caffeine. Like, remember, caffeine's a whole umbrella. You know, it's not one chemical, it's a whole grouping of chemicals. And it's a huge discussion, which Patrick could take, tell us a lot about, because I only know a few things about it. But I, uh, I think it's, it's an amazing thing. So there's other 
you know, there's other kinds of, uh, of stimuli, and I think we should experiment with the other polys and see if they work for us, maybe not in a caffeine way, maybe in some other way. So uh, there's one that's very common in the woods, the, uh, the opaca. Not in a day, would you hold that up? Is an amazing book on patterning of knowing families, and I take the time to look in there and get a sense of that. Uh, but um, for instance, with the what is it, will you look up the mustard family? So he'll have a one-liner in there on what you know what the mustard family is and does. So on my spectrum of food, medicine, poison, I'd say I don't know any poisons that are in this family. Um, some strong medicines and some foods. I mean, a food, like when you go into the health, I mean, go into a, bro, a produce section of a store, um, and you go into the produce, you know, like anywhere from six to 15 of those plants you see there, the foods there, are going to be the same, uh, all the same species that have been warped out in different ways, and it's all a certain kind of mustard called Brassica oleracea. And I got to see that wild one in England for the first time, you know, the one that they took in and started working in the gardens and shifting. And so they made all these foods. What did they make with brassica oleracea? Does anyone know? Broccoli, Broccoli cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. Broccoli flour. flour, cabbages, collards, kale. Uh, you know, all of the same plant. Isn't that funny? I mean, this is the thing we got to watch out with commercing is they, they start to act like you're you know, you're doing something you're not, you know, but it, you know, it's not that it's not GMO. I'm not saying it's that kind of thing, but it's selective, just like they did with the carrot. They just kept bro and they found, and there was this guy, Luther Burbank. Have you ever heard of him? Anyone yeah. ever heard of him? If you've been to California, Yarrow. And then when you're, if you're up for it and you feel good about it, just take a, take that leaf and crumble it up and put it in your mouth and let it roll around in your mouth and talk to you a little bit. If you want, you can crumble a little more and smell it at the same time. And notice if your eyes are closed that there's little uh, lights like firing off around your brain and your eyes. That's, I think, sort of the, di the, sort of the life force of the plant coming into your body. Sorry, a lot of you may know that story, but she's the head of the sort of um, disturbed land. comes into disturbed, desecrated land and covers it. It's a stay back. Um, allows the other members of her tribe to come in. There are a lot of these biannuals, so they send that root way down deep, and then they come up and then they die in the second year and bring all that humus to the top. Of the that is like a band aid over whatever happened to fire, uh, blood, uh, you know, Kmart, whatever. <laughs> Take it over, you know, eat it up, turn it around, flip it over, peel it over, and then the trees start coming in the, you know, the tulip trees and the maples and the and there's a whole bunch of them, depending on what slope you're on and what altitude. You come in and take over the land, start shading it out. And then she's, you know, she's a native plant. The Native Plant Society doesn't seem to remember that. They don't have, like, honor or poison ivy day. They mm -hmm. take her down just as much as they take down the exotics. You know. So she feeds uh, animals. You know, birds love her, her berries. And, and um, I like her. I think she's pretty cool because she keeps mm. people to the trail. <laughs> and those people, as we were talking about, if they had like infinite energy, would we be, or would we be just like cutting everything down? Because it would be easy to do. Or uh, so, let's keep people on the trail so they have respect. You know, so, yeah, I have. To, I don't know. <laughs>